Uh, good afternoon, home language and F first additional language, both STs and um, FETs. Yes, it's the 1st of May, um, and here we start in May already. Can you believe it? It's a beautiful day in Port Elizabeth. The sun is shining. So I thought I'd get the recording done so you can all get into week seven. I see many people are trying to get access to it, but I haven't published it yet. Once I've uploaded the links um, and the PowerPoints for this week today, I will open it up for you so those of you who are intrigued and want to get on with your studies um it'll be all open for you and uh, for those of you that don't want to well it will be open for you as well so i'm going to share my powerpoint with you and i have closed it so i'm going to have to open it again just bear with me yeah, i hope i can get it now i'm going to try again Close my share, start again sharing. Yes, there it is. Okay. Yes, I looked at it just now and then I closed it and I didn't realize it had been closed, but I'm going to now share with you. Let me just get it onto slide share and get rid of that. It's turned into a bit of a episode. Okay, there it is. Um, short stories and novels. Uh, the short stories is a smaller version of the novel has the same kind of um, elements which we'll look at now um, you can bring this into any kind of novel study that you're going to but it's in more complex and more detailed when you get into the novels so short stories it is and we all love short stories the whole drama of a short story but before i get into that i just wanted to just again remind you that on 3rd of may at 1645 dr eileen shekel will be speaking to us she is the writer of chapter 10 um reading strategies and practices um, and she's also written many articles and she especially did a PhD on reading clubs as third spaces um, and what she does as with reading clubs. I'm not too sure what she's going to discuss with us on, on Wednesday. I have asked her and once I get that information I will send an announcement um, for you all to have a look at what she does. There she is. Um, I'm pointing at her. Can you see at the blue t-shirt? And so Dr. Eileen Shekel will be speaking to us on Thursday, on Wednesday, and I'm looking forward to that as well. Right, so how are you coping? I sent out the Mentimeter. I think about 18 and 19 of both the first additional language and home language students have actually answered that. And for THS and for TFF, let's see how you are feeling, how you're coping with the stress. Um, are you dealing with it? So if you look at the TFS and Ss, it seems like the word is overwhelmed, anxious. Um, but some people are still excited, um, awful, so quite negative, rather well, which is nice. It's understandable, I'm confused, I'm exhausted, everything is well, which is quite nice, enjoyable, good. So there are some good things, but it seems like overwhelming volumes. I'm sure it's not only from my course, but from all the courses, is keeping you on your toes. Let's see what the TFF said. THF and SSA, um, being overwhelmed again is the, the overwhelming word, um, but still a bit of enjoyable and confident, trying my best, fairly well stable. So a bit of positivity coming through, surviving, enjoying the lectures. Thank you. Oh, and then we've got can't cope, can't cope at all, disappointed, mental breakdown, um, steadily trying my best, pushing through, finding my way. Um, so hopefully this positive side will actually deplete the overwhelm inside and you feel that you can cope as well. So thanks for sharing. It is still open. So if you want to add your ideas on how you're feeling, that would be really appreciated. Again, um, this is the first additional language. Um, if you tease, how are you doing with your online tracking? Um, I have released 5.1 and 5.2. I will release um, 6 today. I see it has been done. It seems like um, 58 was the highest number I've had for 5.1 and then 5.57 um, for um, 5.2 out of the 72. So it still seems like the, this, this number of about 53, 55 seems to be the, the active people in this group. Um, Miss Adams is the SP's lecturer, so I'm sure she will add on the details for you. I did add up to I did add these on until um 3.2 and seemed like about 81, 83 was the number for the SPs. So that leaves about 50 students. I'm not too sure what's happening with them. 
Okay, it says two is now due. Remember, or this should be from um, the online tracking one until 4.2 um, will be re um, introduced and reopened in the last week of the semester. So don't stress about that. For home language, yes, again, 98 and 111 for SP seems to be the numbers. Again, um, we seem to have this quite a nice little burst of people trying to do things with 5.1, 73 of you, which was the highest number so far. Um, 78 was a repeat for um, 5.1 with SPs, which seems to be the, the extreme side, although up to 84 did submit for SPs, your um, SS1. So that means that there is a potential for 84 people to do this all the time. And then 65 actually submitted SS1 for FET still shows about 20 students are not actually submitting. I don't think that many did the late registration. So I think there's only about 10. So we're still about 75. So there are still students out there that haven't connected on the tracking or on the submissions. Again, this is going to be for um, up to your tracking one, two, three, and four will again be repeated in the last week of the semester. Okay, don't forget that. And uh, yes, if you're feeling a bit like that, I think I feel like that as well at times. Just a quick note on the activities. Yes, um, the reading is closed now. That closed last night. Um, next week is going to be the online tracking for the, the short story and novel. And then the same next week will be your SS2 design with your lesson plan design, the one of listing for um, SPs on the 9th and the prepared oral for the um, FETs on the 11th of May. And then from the 14th of May, 21st of May, 28th of May, we'll go on with weeks 8, 9, and 10 um, online tracking and finish off um, on the 30th of May with the genre-based workshop presentation for SPs and for the FETs that'll be on the 1st of June. I will put an overview of this up in the next week or so for you, those of you that want to start with this. Yes, time management is critical so it needs to be included there we are again on to unit three week seven short stories and novel i will open it up this afternoon so you can get your recordings going and see what's happening there and that'll officially open on the 2nd of may yes you've got your ss2 due on the 9th of may for sps 11th of may for fets and then you've got your ss3 your designer genre-based workshop which is due on the 30th of may for um, SPs and then also FETs, it's the 1st of June. Okay, there's another student evaluation coming through as well at the end. Okay, unit three, we've done chapter 10, which was the reading, the theories and practices. We've looked at the the speed reading, speed reading um, practices, and we looked at the intensive comprehensive reading practices last week as well. So we've covered all of that. We're starting on the um, teaching literature in the first traditional and home language classroom, how to teach it. And we're going to look to, today, particularly at the short story and novel, um, next week at poetry and drama. So yes, once upon a time has always starts and then the end. Please go and see chapter 12 with Ferreira. It'll be covering all these genres as well. And then we're going to go on to visual literacy, as you can see all the sections that will be covered, and finish finally with best language teaching practices, which is a synthesis of looking at what happened this semester and which we can extract as best teaching practices. So let's look at the nature of reading. Please go and see your resource notes in week six. Go and check those out as well. Um, reading is an extremely complex process and no one can explain it really satisfactorily. So there's no clear-cut reason on why it is so difficult to read. There are many theories though. So most models of reading are only partial um, and they're concerned with specific aspects about reading. So perhaps looking at cognitive theories, what they say about reading, or look at the different stages of reading from novice or beginning readers to skilled readers, and then also look at different types of reading like I think there's screen reading now, oral reading, silent reading, loud reading, all those different kinds of reading. However, these models do not account for all aspects of reading and the process of reading. And there's been no single model that can be called the, that can be called the most acceptable. So all these, all these models and theories are partial. And I think maybe an integration of them all might give us the best account of it. 
So let's go look at Ferreira. She's got a reading theory model and we're going to go on page 135 to 136. There she explains the top down, bottom up and interactive models. So if you're going in the bottom up, you're going to start with the, it's a phonetic approach to reading by decoding letters and words first and building up to comprehension, whereas the top down goes from comprehension, understanding the text, and then it goes all the way down to looking at decoding words and letters. And then the interactive approach is the whole language approach, the up and the down, the bottom and the top together. So can we do both? Yes. And I think you can. So let's just look at the bottom up and top down approaches in a bit more detail. Please go and look at the table 10.1 on Ferreira, page 136, that explains this. Um, the bottom up model is data driven. So you're going to go from letters, the decoding of letters and words, all the way to sentences, and finally ending up with comprehension of the whole text. If you're looking at the top down, it's the other way. It's the opposite of the bottom up. It's the whole to the parts. So we can start with meaning and comprehension at the top of the passage. Then we're going to look at sentences, then we look at word recognition, then we look at letters and sounds. So we're going to go down, and Ferreira suggests we go and integrate it, where we do both aspects, the meaning first, and then the words, and vice versa as well. So the interactive model is a process between the learner's background knowledge and the text. So we try and, again, look at what does the learner know and what does the text say. So the reader uses the top-down when processing the text, all right, to the words, or the reader can use the bottom up from the phonics, the letters, the words, the sentences to the meaning. So you can, you can use both of these. So these are the two strategies that you can balance between when you're doing reading. So if you look at the bottoms up or the phonetics, phonics approach, you're going to decode words, you're going to look at capital letters, you're going to look at proper nouns. You can, It's a graded reader approach where they start with the novice and they go to up to advanced it's looking at patterns in writing. So that's your bottoms up. But if you look at the top down, you look at the whole language approach. Um, you look at the background knowledge, what the student has or what's happening in the story. You predict and you infer as we looked at um, intensive reading practices. You guess the meaning of unknown words from the context. You don't spell them out and then go and look them up. Um, you skim and you scan. All those important speed reading and intensive reading practices come into the top down. Um, if you look at the short story in the novel, um, please go and look at table 12.1. This is quite important in Ferreira, page 184. And she looks at various elements that you need to include when you're going to analyze a short story, which is quite important. From the setting, which is the time and the location, to the style, what kind of writing does the, the author use, the characters and the relationships, the plot, which is the storyline, what is the theme, and things like that. So if you go to Ferreira, I think there's about 16 things you need to look at. I, I might be might be exaggerating a bit, but let's just check if, I, if I'm right. So first of all, she talks about the setting, which is the location and the time, then the plot, then the structure of the short story. And it's got various elements in it from the exposition, which is the background of the story, to the development, the complexities and the conflicts that happen in the short story, the rising action, the conflict, the climax, the top section of the story. I'm going to show you a diagram of that now. Denouement, the falling action, and the resolution at the end. So it's like someone climbing a mountain. We've got the exposition, which is all the background information to your story, establishes the setting and describes the situation. So you have that at the beginning of the story. Then you've got the rising action, where the characters face or try and resolve a problem. Um, this results in some conflicts within themselves and others. So you've always got this conflict in the short story. Then you reach the climax where the story reaches a crucial moment and tension that is building up reaches a peak. There's something that's going to happen. And you've got the folly in action. This is what we also call the denouement. Um, this part of the story um, explores the consequences of the, of the climax, what actually happened. And the tension in the story begins to ease is, is the unraveling of what actually happened. And the resolution finally is this final problem of the story is now solved, even the reader with a sense of completion. So you feel well, this whole thing has been worked out. So think about all the short stories you've read and you'll see this pattern emerging in all of them. Please go and see table 12.1 in Ferreira, page 184. Okay, there's your resolution. So a with the practical criticism, so we're on number four. It also includes the characters, your, your main character, and you have your protagonist and you've got your antagonist. 
your main character is often a hero. Um, sometimes it can be a bit of a villain. Um, and we often feel sympathy for this person because they are the ones that are going to lose out on something or they're going to experience a problem. And the antagonist is the primary adversary of the protagonist and sometimes the villain. Sometimes the main character can also be the villain. And you also have the flat and all round characters who are just part of the story as well, but you always have the main character can be a female or a male. Five are the themes um, or different kinds of themes that which you're going to look at for your SS3 as well. You can start thinking about themes, love, war, conflict, relationships, um, nature, jealousy, ambition, and so on. Then there are other things you need to look at for, like symbols. Um, if everything is dark, it normally means there's something evil. If something is white, it feels like there's, there's truth and honesty. You can look at the style of the writing, where there's a lot of irony, humor, the diction, the satire, um, the, the whole dialogue. Are there lots of, is there a lot of dialogue? Is there lots of long text? What kind of style do the writer use? And often the title encapsulates um, an aspect of the story. Go look at the title, it's so important. And this can also be symbolic of the whole short story as well. But um, there is another PowerPoint that I'm going to upload, which is on um, the framing of questions and the cognitive levels, cognitive levels of all these questions. You need to go and look at that um, PowerPoint all the time um, so you can determine which cognitive levels you are going to be using in your SS3 as well as in many of your um SS ones, twos, and threes next semester as well. So this is a good PowerPoint to keep. Um, and there you've got Bloom's um, taxonomy of learning. Um, Caps follows pretty much the same thing from the remembering, which is the lower order, um, increasing difficulty to understanding, then applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. This is going to have a look at this in terms of lower and higher order. I'm um, going from the top, which is remembering, which is lower, lower order to creating, which is the highest of the, the triangle. So higher order is evaluating and creating the bottom two. Sometimes a bit of analyzing will come into that too, whereas the lower order goes from the bottom, remembering. This is recalling events. You recall, you remember, it's your long-term memory. Um, going on to understanding, which is your summarizing. So if you're asking somebody to summarize or explain or compare or contrast, that's more understanding, it's the next level. So think about the words you use when you when you are setting questions, applies when you implement um, what you've actually said, what you've learned, what you've summarized, you put into some kind of application. I'm going to just put this little arrow there. Recalling is for remembering. Explaining is for understanding, implementing or applying um, for, for applying, breaking into parts when you analyze something, you organize things, you um, give attributes to certain things and you get a table kind of format with that. Evaluating is when you make judgments based on certain criteria through checking and critiquing things, which is a higher order skill and explaining reasons for why that actually happened or why you said that. And then creating is making something new. You can tell a new ending to a story or suggest a new start to something or a new application for something. This is where you put elements together and you form something new. So these are little words that you can use. If you go into the PowerPoint again, which is another PowerPoint you're going to see, there's a lots of words for each of these sections where you can actually use in the development of your question types. Um, so you know that if you say describe, you know it's an understanding question. Yes, and you've got a task. Um, if you go and have a look in week seven, there's a task. Three things you need to do. I'm going to give you a, a link to, to upload it. It's not difficult. You don't have to write anything hard. Um, it revolves around Goldilocks and the Three Bears. It, re it revolves around Little Red Riding Hood. And for the first one, there it is on Canvas. You're going to go into week seven, access the notes on the short story novel and framing questions and complete with week seven's online mini assignment. Go look on page seven, it is there. Um, so if you look at the Goldilocks and Three Bears, you're going to answer um, activity questions by applying the cognitive level. So I've given you a question and you must say what cognitive level it is. For example, Remembering, the question was, list the items used by Goldilocks while she was in the bear's house. That involves you remembering what she actually had, what she used while she was in the bear house. She used the porridge bowls, she used the bed, she used the chair. So those are things you'd have to remember. It's lower order. 
Or what about the creating question? Propose how the story could be different if it were Goldilocks and the three fish. That's being creative, but you've got, I think, six questions there, and you just have to identify which one it is. Um, I, th I haven't decided how I'm going to put this on Canvas, but I might just do this as a multiple choice type question as well, which might be easier to mark as well. Right, then you're going to have to read Little Red Riding Hood, the story. Again, if you haven't done it already, there she is with the big bad wolf. Um, then you're going to answer questions and identify the cognitive levels of each question. So describe what um, Red did when she first saw the wolf. Okay, so you'd have to say what kind of question is that? If it says describe, it might mean that's going to be understanding. All right, and then... Then you have to answer the question as well. What did she actually do? Rank the characters from best to worst and explain how you rank them. So you've got these three characters. You've got the wolf, you've got your granny, and you've got Little Red Riding Hood. Which one was the best? Which one was the worst? And what was the reason that you ranked them like that? I think there's also the woodcutter that came along that helped Little Red Riding Hood. I'm just going to check the story too. And then finally, you've got to select a short story. Any short story could be, Hansel and Gretel, it could be Rapunzel. You can decide if you want to do something deeper than that, than a fairy story, Cinderella. You just have to choose a short story, then apply the practical criticism approach to analyze. Remember, those are the six points that you saw on, in Ferreira on page 184. You have to go look at that from the setting to the location, to the characters, to the, um, all the, the, the rising action, the falling action, the denouement, and all those elements, the exposition, you have to sort of fill that in. So go check again the practical criticism on Ferreira. And this is the page seven on Canvas that you will see this whole exercise. There's all the, the questions. Um, what would you say that is? Read them and say what they are. Um, Little Red Riding Hood, read the story there and say if it's remembering, understanding and analyzing. Um, I think I'm going to have to redo number one because I think I've given you all the answers there. And then you've got to select your short story, the final one. So it's all on, it's all on um, Canvas. You go and check it out there as well. Okay, so what's next? We're finished again. We're still busy with reading. We're going to go and get poetry next week and then a bit of drama after that. Okay, so enjoy your last day of the long weekend. Hope you're all doing well. Um, look forward to um just being Without me, I think, this week, excepting on Wednesday when Dr. Eileen Shekel will be there to speak to us about reading. Okay, so chat soon and goodbye for now. I'm going to stop my share. Hope you can make um, headway in what I was saying and you can get on with week seven. So I'm going to end the meeting for all.